Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome to Oblong Online. I'm Helen Soslowski, the Events Director for Oblong Books and Music. Before I welcome our guests this evening, I have a few um, instructions for you and some information. If you have questions for Nadia or Rebecca at any time during the presentation, you can type them into the chat, which you'll find on the right-hand side of your screen. You can also type questions in the Ask a Question module, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. For those of you who would like to purchase a signed copy of either of the books featured this evening, there's a Buy the Book button at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you who prefer to listen to their literature, there's a link to purchase both audiobooks in the chat. We couldn't be more excited to have Nadia Owuso and Rebecca Carroll joining us this evening for what promises to be a really interesting discussion about their respective memoirs. Nadia Owuso followed her father, a United Nations official, from Europe to Africa and back again. And just as she and her family settled into a new home, her father would tell them it would be time to up and leave and say goodbye. Any of us who are military children can relate to that very, very closely. She arrived in New York feeling stateless, motherless, and uncertain about her future. Yet she was eager to find her own identity. But it wasn't an easy journey for her. Her memoir, Aftershocks, is a debut and is the means by which she has finally come to understand that the only ground firm enough to count on is the one written into existence by her own hand. Welcome, Nadia. Thank you. Rebecca Carroll grew up the only black person in her rural New Hampshire town. She was adopted at birth by artistic parents who believed in peace, love, and zero population growth. Her early childhood was loving and idyllic, and yet she couldn't articulate the deep sense of isolation she increasingly, increasingly felt as she got older. Her memoir, Surviving the White Gaze, recounts her painful struggle to overcome a completely white childhood to forge her identity as a black woman in America. Author Roxane Gay called Surviving the White Gaze intelligent, melancholic, and searching, and said that Carol reveals in the book that just past survival, it's possible to find peace and joy. Welcome, Rebecca. Welcome, Thank Nadia you. and Rebecca. We're so happy you're here with us, and we're all very anxious to hear your stories and your individual perspectives. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Take it away. Thank you so much. Nadia, <laughs> what oh. is happening? Listen, <laughs> as I was reading your memoir, there were a few times where I was, it just felt eerie. Like the similarities are wild, right? I and know. So, and so we're, I think you're about a decade younger than me. And I waited a, a very long and specific period of time before writing my memoir. How did you know that you were okay with writing it and that it was time to do it? Well, um, so I, I actually started writing it, and I'm, I have a, a question for you related to this, but I started writing it kind of as a private project. Um, I, I was sort of coming out of a period of depression and anxiety, and I was kind of trying to figure out, you know, if I could tell myself a new story because the story mm -hmm. I was given didn't serve me anymore. Right. Right. Or had never served me probably. Yeah. And so I started really doing a lot of research about, you know, the places that my family came from because I, you know, was a UN kid and I grew up moving all over the world. Um, in some ways I was, I had connection to all of these places. My father was Ghanaian. My mother is Armenian American. I lived, you know, moving between Europe and East Africa. Um, so, you know, that was such a gift in so many ways, but at the same time, I always felt kind of disconnected from the history mm -hmm. stories of my family um, that were often sort of mistreated in, in the education systems that I went yeah. through, and just the messages I received from the world. And so mm -hmm. I started to kind of try to interrogate those stories for myself to, as like an act of, of healing, and self-discovery and I was really doing a lot of research you know about the Ashanti Empire which my father you know uh, was a descendant of and the Armenian genocide which is why I'm American and um, sort of and stories of abandonment you know my mother left when I was two and trying to figure out like if there was a different narrative that I could create um, and so I was really writing for myself which I think was like really a gift and I didn't think that it was gonna be a book 
um, necessarily. I was working on a novel and I thought that that's kind of the book that I was going to send out into the world. But I kept coming back to this story. Mm -hmm. um, and then several years later, probably like three or four years later, I came back to it and wondered, you know, if I could make art out of it. Um, and that was really scary. You know, like, I think part of your question is like, when did you feel like it was okay to write it? When I was writing for myself, it was one thing, but then thinking about sort of putting it out into the world was another thing. Um, but, but I realized that I think it was James Baldwin who said, you know, I think each of us has a story that we have to tell and until we tell that story, we can't, we probably won't be able to tell another one. And I was really struggling with this novel. So I just kind of made myself kind of sit with that raw material and look at it differently and think about sort of how could I shape this into art that I would put out into the world. That's so interesting. I mean, of course we have, we share so many of the same kind of, you know, role models, mentors, literary heroes, icons and whatnot, but the idea of not being able to tell other stories until you, until you tell this one story. And I feel like it was sort of reversed for me in the in a way, which is that I told everybody else's story before, you know, I arrived at a place where I felt I had the um, emotional fortitude and intellectual freedom um, to write my own story. That said, it also felt in the writing of it that I couldn't go further in my work whether it be at, in in writing or in podcasts or in whatever kind of content creation until I had written this book. Yeah, I was kind of curious, you know, because you know I was familiar with your uh, past work and of Reportage and Sugar in the Raw, which was, you know, this award-winning book. But what was it like to to kind of excavate your own, and you were definitely dealing with similar themes, you know, in some mm -hmm. ways. So mm -hmm. I think in some ways you were writing this story, but just through the lens of other people's experience. Right. But what was it like to kind of turn to your own, emotionally turn to your own story and sort of excavate, you know, I think as memoirists, we're often asked, like, what is it like to put your work in the world? But what was it like to kind of write it? What, what did that feel like in the body to kind of turn to your own narrative? I think it's so astute that you said, you know, that all along I had been writing the story, but just sort of through different sort of um, avenues and, 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 personages, but also community, right? Like I, I very much created a black community in the in the work and in the books that I've done, which are all interview based books, starting with a, um, a book about black women writers and um, including the book about black girls growing up in America. Um, and so what I would say in terms of excavation, you know, and, and memoir writing, and you and I both have had trauma um, that involves abandonment, that involves a sexual assault, that involves, you know, a closeness and a yearning and an eagerness um, to connect. Uh, mm -hmm. And and I'm so struck by the way you described um, being an orphan and how you related to the description of it, what it meant to be orphaned. Um, because I think, in part, I'm a bit older, it felt very much like a relief to have those memories live outside of my body, outside of my psyche. Um, I didn't have to care for them anymore. I didn't have to put in the emotional labor of caring for that trauma. Um, and when I figured out how to string all of, you know, memoir is craft. You said you were working on a novel. Um, <laughs> which is also craft, but memoir is not just stringing together experiences. There's a, it's a real craft. And so for mm -hmm. it, for both of us, these, these are first memoirs and um, you know, we had to write the shitty first drafts and figure out, right. You know, yeah. <laughs> but what the sort of what the through line is. Um, so once I figured out what the through line was, which is it's only things that speak to surviving the white gaze that will, that will be in this mm -hmm. book. Um, then it just started to tumble out, um, for which I'm endlessly grateful and became a kind of joy, a process of joy in, in excavating because I had lived enough with them and mm -hmm. lived enough with those memories. Yeah. I mean, I could really feel in your writing the way that you were sort of 
um, in a similar, it felt, it, I felt very connected to you in a way because I feel like my project too was sort of writing myself toward belonging, writing myself toward self-discovery, writing myself toward community and love and yeah. connection. And I could definitely feel those principles sort of driving your work as well. Um, and sort of as an act of revision and re reimagining, you know, the stories that, that you had been given. And I actually, um, I have your book here. Yeah, I have yours. <laughs> With the prologue, I, I, under, yeah. <laughs> I, I do a lot of underlining. Yeah. In the prologue, you write, um, this is what black folks are to one another. We are the light that affirms and illuminates ourselves to ourselves, a light that shines in its reflection of unbound blackness, brighter and beyond the white gaze. And I just, I mean, I read that so many times. It just really stuck with me because in some ways that was sort of my project too, was writing myself toward that community and that, you know, that community of love. And so I'm wondering like, was that a principle that you were holding in your writing? To what extent was the writing of the book part of the process of getting to to that connection? I'm just would love to hear you talk about that a little bit. So I think again, um, I had it's because I had arrived at the connection that I was able to write it, mm -hmm. and also, and I've said this, um, I've told this anecdote um, many times before, but it bears repeating, which is that. Um, in 2014, uh, when Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson, and my son, who was then eight or nine at the time, said, "Are we going to get shot, Mom? Because we're black." And that his the power and purity and and incisiveness of his question unleashed this kind of fury in me that had that was multi pronged. Right? It was like. A, a rage that that the the white folks, my white family, had been so nonchalant mm -hmm. about their liberalism and about the violence that is inflicted on black bodies. Um, and and it was interesting. And I'm, I don't mean to digress, but how you talked about being protected in you know your expat bubble. And I don't know if you feel a similar kind of rage in that. You know that protectiveness was not protectiveness really for me it was actually a disassociation it was a decision that what what was out there was worse than what was in there mm -hmm. um but it was also about um ha knowing that i arrived at a place that i could provide something and leave something for my son right this is really the, a legacy from for my son um to, you know so that he not only can understand what my experience was but also i think of it very much of uh, not just surviving, but of becoming, you know, mm -hmm. surviving the white gaze and becoming a black woman in America. Um, but it's also, you know, a kind of template for navigating systemic racism from jump without yeah. having any of the tools um, and sort of figuring out, how, you know, strategizing. I mean, do you, like, I found myself looking at some of these periods in my life and thinking, girl, good on you. Like, wow. Other times, not so much, you yeah. know, you and I both share, right? Yeah. A, uh, an instance where we um, aligned, allied ourselves with white, the white peers against mm -hmm. blackness because we understood inherently the value of whiteness and the value less of blackness. Um, but then there's other times where I'm sort of like, wow, you really figured that out. Yeah. And nobody's really helping. Do you feel that? I do. I do. And in some ways, you know, I think a lot of my education to go back to kind of what you were speaking to in terms of feeling the rage. Um, I do think that, yes, there was the protectiveness of growing up in this UN bubble, but also, you know, we were we were one of few black families a lot of the time in that bubble, including when we lived in Africa a lot of the time. And um, and so kind of realizing the ways that I did have to kind of pretzel myself to fit into those spaces. Um, yes. You know, I got good at it. So like, right. it didn't feel like that protected me, certainly. But um, then to think about all of the parts of myself that I hid from myself, that I hid from others in order to fit into those boxes. Right. Um, big way coming to America, um, you know, I didn't live here until I was 18. 
I've been black all my life, obviously, and I was raised with the black side of my family um, because my my mother was white, but she left when I was two. But at the same time, becoming black and becoming a black woman in America was a real education for me and really opened my eyes um, to to both sort of the violence and the oppression that has been historically inflicted on black peoples kind of across the diaspora. I was able to kind of make some of the connections. You know, my father was a Pan-Africanist and so would always talk to me about that deep connection between African peoples across the diaspora, um, the independence movements, particularly in Ghana where he was from. But I was able to make that connection myself arriving here and sort of looking around and just seeing, you know, the ways that the inequities play out in people's day-to-day -day lives, the way the oppressions play out in people's day-to-day -day lives. And I did begin to then feel that rage. And through that rage, I was able to then make connections to the kind of um, the, the ways in which whiteness had always sort yeah. of been the, the force in my life that sort of uh, required me to um, ignore parts of myself, make myself small in certain ways. And, you know, it really opened my eyes to that because you can get sort of comfortable within that privilege, the the white adjacent privilege. You right, know? right. But it's not, um, at the end of the day, it's, it's still not serving you. And oh, it's definitely not serving you. I mean, what you just said reminds me of something that I wrote early on in the book about sort of being ushered through life, you know, with this kind of white privilege and white adjacency, you know, and that my black dance teacher, like I was in order to to um, receive that and benefit from that white privilege, I had to also not be um part of her world and her family. Um, and that was really confusing. Uh, and I didn't have language, right? Like I'm, I'm very interested too with you, um, how you have sort of developed language to talk about these experiences that we had, right? I'm, I'm thinking specifically about your relationship with George, which more on that later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but when you when you were code switching, right? Did you even know that it was called code switching? No, definitely yeah. not. It was just yeah. something that I knew that I had to do. You know, that's what you do. You you show up and you look around and you ask yourself, okay, what kind of space this is? More often than not, it's a white space that I'm being dropped into. And what do I need? Who do I need to be in this space? You know, right. Like that's, that was just sort of something that I innately learned. Um, and I see, you know, I see that in your story as well. And um, that's what the, the the kind of seeing the scene with your dance teacher so devastating because there was so much beauty and joy and love in that connection. And you yep. know, I guess that's what I mean when I say we lose pieces of ourselves, like not to be able to embrace that and connect with it, um, which also was something that I gave up in a lot of ways, you know, in my experience in boarding school, for example, in England, where I was mm -hmm. one of a few black students and as you said, sort of aligned myself with a group of white girls who are bullying this this black girl in the school because I understood the way the racial arrangement worked without having the language, you know, without yep. knowing how to kind of um, how to understand that, how to articulate it. I just sensed that my ability to get by in this school that that's what would be required of me to get by and to get over girl, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not just getting by, it's like clearly you and I both were ambitious um, and and sort of outgoing girls with personality. You know, we wanted to go places, we wanted to do things. And so, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's cliche and reductive to say we played the game because it wasn't just playing the game, it was also figuring out how to play the game as as someone who looks like us and who will always be in this um, conundrum of uh, of being difficult or being loud or all of the all of the tropes that we're tethered to from the very beginning of our existence, the way that we're over sexualized, the way that we are, you know, I mean, the, the times that I have experienced and I've written about in the book where, you know, white peers would say, you can't just show up and take over, <laughs> right? Like, you would never say that to a white peer. Right. Whereas, you know, as you said, I was just trying to get by, but also get over. I wanted to do stuff. Yeah. 
Exactly. And, and the, the negotiation that you had to do with yourself in order to get there. And, right. and some, some of the lies that, that, that right. we had to tell ourselves as well, right. we okay with, with what we were doing in our own complicity in, in upholding that arrangement. Um, yeah, that, that, that too had to be part of the reckoning, you know, and, and I, that's, that's one of the things as well that connected to me with your book is that it was really important to me to implicate myself Yes. System so that I could better understand, you know, like what I'm not going to do anymore. Right. What I will not be willing to do anymore, no matter what spaces I'm in. Yeah. I mean, that was a real, um, that was a real learning curve for me that started, you know, when I actually discovered the idea of white gaze, you and I were both deeply influenced by Toni Morrison. Um, and, uh, I don't write this in the book, but I have, I've said this on the tour, you know, I, I was working at, as a producer at Charlie Rose, um, and now not Charlie Rose. Um, and she was on the show and she was talking about this white gaze and I was standing in the control room and I was listening to her say, talk about this. And I was like, right? Like that's what it is. Yeah. What I've been trying to get out from under, what I've been trying to reconcile, what I have internalized so deeply. Um, but it, that was, you know, 20 years ago and it took a very long time to then identify the places where the white gaze had done the most damage mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and i think about the relationship we have these parallels i mean there's so many parallels in the book but the this parallel relationship i had wyatt you had george um these sort of white guys who were you know smart and proper and um, preppy and, um, you know, like made us feel what, what, what would you say that you didn't say in the book about your relationship with George? Um, too focused on the ways that the world perceived me as a black person in particular, you know, that was a big thing with him. Like if it, I, there was an episode that I was, um, that I wrote about in the book where, you know, I was having a really hard time getting a job. Um, after graduate school, yes. and I kept getting rejected. And a lot of the time they would say, you know, it's a culture fit. Uh, it's not a good culture fit. And I said to him, I was like, I think that they mean you're black. Yeah. <laughs> and they're saying yeah. this to me, like, I think that's what they mean. Um, and especially because I would do so well on the phone interviews, you know, right. I got right. an interview and, and then I would go in in person with my braids or, you know, cause at that point I was showing up as who I was. And I was like, I, I think that they mean that I'm too black for this job. And he was like, but why would you say that? It's a nonprofit as though the nonprofit oh. complex is not racist. You know, it's like anytime I would point out an instance of racism, he just could not. The gaslighting though <laughs> is just bananas, right? But also like the vulnerability that you share in the book, but also right now being like, I think it was, of course it was, yeah. right? <laughs> of course it was. And you know, what I, what I say a, a lot of the time to mentees and, and young black women sort of figuring stuff out is that your instinct is generally right. And what you need is the language to contextualize that instinct. So much of my younger years, I didn't have the language, but I knew that something was not right. Yeah. Um, that, I mean, that just totally reminds me of, of a summer that I worked, um, that I was, that I was with Wyatt and we lived, um, just outside of Princeton and I was working at a, um, a clothing store in retail. And like on the second day, the boss said, there's something missing on the display table. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she said, do you know where it is? And I said, no. And she said, are you sure? And I remember it saying to Wyatt, like, she's suggesting that I stole it. it. <laughs> and that's racist. And he was like, I'm sure that's not what she meant, right? Yeah, it's that. It's that kind of gaslighting, which, you know, is is related to, you know, the good white folks in our lives yeah. and their, yeah. term, their how determined they can be to not see race. Mm -hmm. I know that's the answer to the problem, you know, like that them not seeing race is going to solve racism. I think it's really important while we're on that idea of racelessness or, you know, um, you know, racial, post-racial or whatever uh, people, white liberals like to say, is that it's not passive. 
That's not a mm-hmm. passive stance to take. It's actually quite aggressive mm-hmm. to say to black folks, particularly specifically black folks, I will value you only if I don't see who you are. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like I don't notice. I, I'm like, you yeah. definitely do notice. Of course you notice, but also you don't get to decide yeah. whether you notice or not. Yes, definitely. And and like that says a lot about what value you're placing on your the default, which is whiteness, of right? Course. That's their default. And so by saying I don't see you as black or I don't see color or like basically you're saying I am welcoming wel- welcoming you into whiteness, which I don't want that invitation. It's welcoming into whiteness, but it is also saying I'm welcoming you because I don't see something that is so integral to your identity, Mm -hmm. right? Like I, you know, I had um, a white peer reach out to me a couple of years ago after I wrote an op-ed about something and she was like, we, you know, we never saw a race. It was only ever you, just you and your personality. And I was like, but how... Could you not, right? Um, but I want to also ask you about um, your father um, and the closeness there and what it felt like to write about that relationship with him not being here. Um, you know, I had a, I had a very, very close relationship with my adoptive father, which has sort of shifted and would have written, I think, more about it if he weren't still alive. So I just wonder what it feels like to write about that relationship uh, now. Yeah, I mean, one of the big, the most important things for me about the book was, you know, I had long been carrying this grief about the loss of my father, who, because my mother left when I was two, was sort of the center of my world and the most important person in my life and, you know, my teacher and guide and we did have a really close, loving relationship. And when I lost him, I sort of felt like I had to just keep moving forward because if I looked too closely at that grief, I was going to fall apart. And I think that that's right. something that um, happens to a lot of people who experience grief early on. But it, you can't run away from it. You know, but what I found was that I was carrying that grief in my body. And so in writing about my father, when I was writing this um, this is kind of as a private project and without the intention to publish it. What I found is that actually in writing about him, I could, f- I could find him in some mm. way, you know? because on the other side of grief is love and like grief is the extension of the love that I had for him. And so in telling those stories, even just to myself, I realized that I was able to connect with him again and to sort of hear his voice and the stories that he told me. And it actually, um, you know, in, in the Ashanti culture, which my father came from, we believe that ancestors are with us kind of shaping all the time, guiding us all, and, and past all and the present. Time. And so in a way it was, I, I found a way to sort of embrace that and to welcome him into my life in a new way, kind of as an ancestor um, and to sort of celebrate our relationship Um, And at the same time, you know, I think what I, well, I know that what I had done as well, because I needed sort of something big to believe in, because I felt like my life had fallen apart in so many ways. And so I kind of made of him a deity. Um, And that Mm -hmm. was not serving me either, that story of my father as this perfect. Right. And so one of the projects of the book, too, was to like give him the fullness of his humanity back, like the, all of the complications that we all have as human beings and to, um, to sort of see him as a man who had a life outside of his relationship with me, Um, which I think as children, we don't often do with our parents, but that was really important um, for me to do as well, to sort of complicate the stories that I had told myself and sort of set myself free from the idea of perfection uh, being attainable for anybody, even the person that I loved most in the world. You know, I mean, I love that. And I could feel, I, I missed him on your behalf. And that's a sign of really good writing. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to say is um, in response to this notion that on the other side of grief is love. So if on the other side of grief is love is on the other side of love grief. 
I, I think so. I mean, the reality of life is that we're, we're, we're going to lose people, right? And also that people will disappoint us, you know, and particularly the people that we love the most. And I think part of coming to terms with our origin stories, which I think is a lot of what both of our projects are about, like we have to like look at the, the love and the hard parts and we have to sort of make meaning of them. And I think that that like being willing to sort of do that in terms of our relationships with others and also to self interrogate, to go back to what we were talking about before, like that, that is, that's the way that we find that we free ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. we're able mm -hmm. to sort of learn and carry on in the world and um, continue to sort of show up um, better for the people who, who love us as well. Mm -hmm. and, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to ask you because we were just talking about origin stories and, you know, um, there is so much that sort of connects our stories in, in, in so many ways. And both of us were often sort of like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz, you know, <laughs> places like looking around like this yeah. is Kansas, this is not. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, you know, part of my project too, you know, a principle that I was holding was sort of kind of examining that feeling of displacement and sort of reckoning with it. And I'm curious sort of how that sense of displacement sort of showed up in your, or not just in this book, but generally in your life as a writer, like what, what that has meant for you as an observer of human behavior and as a writer. What the displacement has meant to me as a writer? Yeah. Like how does it sort of inform the way you see the world? I think one of the one of the things about which I am so grateful is that the displacement has always been anchored by, as you said, um, ancestors mm -hmm. showing up. Um, I feel quite certain that black folks have been dropped into my life mm -hmm. at pivotal moments. Um, and certainly when I discovered black literature, I mean, when I read Zora Neale Hurston and Toni Morrison and Audre Lorde, it was like, I mean, it was, it, it was both, it was bittersweet, right? Cause it was both like, <sighs> and also I, the hell, I mean, I needed them, right? <laughs> I needed them. Um, but I, I would say that this displacement, and I have said this to my son numerous times, how, wherever you are, or wh however you, f you navigate this world, the ancestors are looking out for you. Mm -hmm. They have made space for you. They saw you coming. They want you to thrive. Um, that wasn't the case when I was younger. When I was, you know, I was a, a devout journal writer. Um, I have hundreds, literally hundreds of journals. Weren't very deep when I was growing up. You know, kind of like, well, I went to ballet. Good night. <laughs> as, but, but as I got older, you know, the, I, I started to grapple with and interrogate and, you know, sort of figure out what that displacement meant. Um, and, it, you know, it was it was certainly um, a troubling but also inspiring kind of trigger, for lack of a better word, to get my bearings mm -hmm. to find my bearings right i think that there are these kinds of things that happen in our lives that encourage and inspire us to evolve mm -hmm. um and some people grab onto that and other people don't yeah right yeah yeah and this like feeling of sort of like grasping at roots you know i had i had the exact same reaction when i discovered um you know, the writers that you've named, Toni Morrison, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, June Jordan, Audre Lorde, oh, but dude. this feeling of like, everything is possible for me now. Yes. <laughs> you know, everything is yes. possible for me. Yes. Now. And I sort of thought of them, you know, growing up sort of um, at times feeling motherless, like as a council of mothers that I could turn to. Yes. And I did sort of discover them young. I was lucky to discover them young and to see myself reflected was such a gift in so many ways. And mm -hmm. that like was one thing that made me feel rooted, you know, in right. this life that, you know, I often felt kind of deracinated from place and sort of like um, not really connected to, um, to any one particular home. So that really resonates with me as well. 
I want to say, you know, and this is um, not necessarily about our, our books, but certainly about our journeys and, and experiences. You know, we both live in bed Brooklyn, which historically black Brooklyn neighborhood. Um, I came to it later, you know, when I first moved to, to Brooklyn, I moved to Crown Heights with my girlfriend, Corinne. Um, and then because I worked in media, I ended up living in a lot of um, sort of wider neighborhoods because that's how you find spaces, especially mm -hmm. if you're poor. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh, somebody has a room in so and so in Cobble Hill or whatever, whatever. But by the time I arrived at a place that I could actually choose where I wanted to live, you know, we we moved here, and it, it, it's so. Um, I th I'm grateful for it every day. I wonder how you feel about all of the places that you've lived, all of the sort of moving around and displacement, as you said, and then ending up. In do or die. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is such a gift. It really is. And, and you know, one of the things that I am so grateful for when I moved to the United States, you know, my connection to America is through the mother, my mother's side of the family, which uh, my father came to the United States for university, which is where he met my mother. My mother was raised in Massachusetts um, in a largely Armenian community because their Watertown, Massachusetts has a really big uh, community of Armenians. Um, but, you know, I wasn't um, until my 20s connected to her and her culture. Um, and so my sort of welcome wagon to America was black people. And like that's sort of where I found my home in the United States. And I'm so grateful to have been welcomed sort of with open arms by by African-Americans um, in the States who, you know, are my first friends in college and sort of helped me to discover who I was in this new country in a lot of ways. And, you know, America is experienced all over the world. So it wasn't completely new to me, like through music and television and culture, like I had an understanding of America and I had been here on vacation a few times as a child, but it really was sort of African Americans who sort of, and, and Caribbean people in, in the US too, um, who sort of became my people. And right, so right. it just made sense to me to kind of settle in bed -Stuy. And also, you know, I feel, um, I feel like a real desire to kind of be part of the, uh, be a good neighbor and be a good member of the community, which is also part of why, you know, as well as being a writer, I kind of, I work in social justice and have made my career in social justice and particular sort of focused on black communities and sort of giving back to the, to the communities that have meant so much to me, you know, coming, coming to this country sort of disconnected um, from, from people and place. Do you like your book? Um, it's, it's, you know, I am so grateful to my book, you know, it's like, it's hard to, to read it as as the writer, because you can always sort of nitpick. But you know, I am so grateful to my book because of what it taught me, what the writing mm. it taught me, mm. um, what I learned about myself as an artist, but also as a person. You know, it was like a real opportunity to kind of self reflect and self interrogate. Um, the connection that I found to the people that I love, you know, in some ways, the, the writing when it was a private project was part of what kind of led to me reconciling with my mother. I wrote myself to a place where I was ready to reach out to her. And so I'm grateful mm. for that as well. You know, so there's so many things that I'm grateful for about this book. And, you know, there are moments when I'm reading from it and I'm like, oh, that's good. You know, like there are <laughs> passages, you know, there are other passages where I'm like, oh, yeah. what I would do differently. Or you want to take out your pen yeah. and, you know, edit. But, but yeah, I'm really, really grateful to this book. What about, what about you? How do you feel about the book? I like it a lot. <laughs> I like it a lot. And I think it's because, again, I waited, you know, it ends, the book ends where it ends for a very um, specific reason, which is that, you know, it's not about the last 18 years of my life because the last 18 years of my life are what allowed me to write the book, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I, I I love the idea of being grateful to it and I am grateful to it. Um, but I also, I like that I, um, I gave it grace and I gave myself grace and I, um, and you know, it sounds so cliche and corny, but I do really feel like I, t I told the, 
the truth. Mm -hmm. And did you do your audiobook? I did. How wild was that? That was so wild. Actually, you know, that probably is kind of where I was able to fall in love with the book. Right. Um, exactly. Ways. I loved that. Yeah. Because it was like literally speaking truth to power. Yes, exactly. Right. It just felt, it felt like such a gift to be able to do that. And I think what you're saying about like, I told the truth, like that, that feeling was really important and meaningful to me, you know, walking away from that experience of sort of speaking the words out loud. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a really lovely experience. I think also, you know, in terms of memoir and what you've said and what your, pre your preface says, which is that it's more about meaning, you know, than, than linear sort of, um, uh, archiving or, or whatnot, or, or chronicling. Um, but I think that's the really amazing thing about memoir too, which is that, and memory, Mm -hmm. um, and Basi Ikpi, who I know blurbed your book, whose own memoir, I'm Lying But I'm Telling the Truth, is extraordinary. Yeah, so extraordinary. Cool. But just that that memory is malleable, but that also our emotions will regenerate yes. um, and, and have a response to it differently every time. Yes. Yeah. I love that. I love yeah. that so much. Let's do some questions. Yes. It's so nice to talk to you. Oh, it's lovely to talk with you. I feel it won't be the last time. So we do. We've got, we've got a whole bunch of questions Ooh. here. Um, okay. Let's start off. I'll take them from the top. Let's start off with a question from Damon, um, who asked the question, what are your impressions of the TV show This Is Us and how it deals, I'm sure you've had this one, and how it deals with the character Randall? who has been raised in a white family. Do you think that's an accurate portrayal? What, what were your takeaways? So I'm one of those people, much to the chagrin of my child, uh, I'm one of those people who sort of engages with the television while I'm watching. <laughs> I feel like I've been engaged with Randall um, and Rebecca, his white adoptive mother, uh, from the very beginning, from season one. I've written about it a couple of times. I think they do a very good job. Um, I... Uh, I think what I'm concerned or what, what, what I feel sort of reticent about is that it will become the story about adoption, that there won't be, that it won't actually open avenues for other adoptive stories, but that will be like, well, we already did that. We've got This Is Us, right? So my hope is that the folks who work on the show, the folks who are moved by the show, the people who are in power will actually use the opportunity of this show to open up more avenues, because I think particularly in this racial reckoning that we're in, you know, um, black adoptees in white families, we have real insight into the sort of core dynamic of America. And so I think adoptive stories are bigger than adoption. Mm -hmm. um, and what I hope is that This Is Us will help, um, help me, help other creatives who happen to be adopted, you know, sort of um, create more wide ranging content. Do you have anything to add to that, Nadia? Do you no, have a? I mean, I that the the notion that um, black adoptees of white parents have something really important to add to this like current conversation of racial reckoning really resonates with me, mm -hmm. um, and and so yeah, I'm just kind of sitting with that. Okay. And kind of relating to that question, uh, Crystal Lynn Minot, Minot asks. What advice might you have for parents raising black children in predominantly white spaces? So I get this question a lot, as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. um, there is no pat answer. Um, the, main, um, the main thing that I want to uh, get across and articulate is that it's not a one-off. Right. This, and this speaks also to um, Nadia, what you were saying you were sitting with, right, which is that black adoptees uh, uh, with white parents, you know, that dynamic is, is central, is integral to the history of America. So along those same lines, if white adoptive parents pursue or approach a, adoption, adoption of black children in the same way that diversity and inclusion initiatives are pursued, in the same way that Black History Month is pursued, um, uh, then we're failing the black children. It's not a one-off, it's not a Serena Williams poster, it's not one uh, black doll. It is an immersion and an engagement, um, a deference, 
but also a cognizance of what you don't know. Your children are your children, but they are also children of black culture. And that means you have to have black culture present in your home, in your life, from the ground up. And what's tricky about this is that a lot of white adoptive parents are, are in a place where they're obviously grown, but don't have any black friends. And so start to think, well, how do should I start to acquire black friends? And any black person who is 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 on the receiving end of that is going to be like, please don't acquire me, <laughs> right? So so I I guess I would say the most important thing is for it to be an authentic and organic um, immersion of blackness, um, and to you know have a community that is not curated. Thanks. Uh, Susie has said, this is a question for Nadia. Excited to hear you did reach out to your Armenian mom. Looking forward to reading about it. Um, can you talk a little bit about that experience, about reconnecting with your mom? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, part of what I was exploring in the book um, was the history that sort of brought my mom's family to America on both sides of her family. Um, her grandparents were survivors of the Armenian genocide. And that was a history that my father really made an effort to kind of, um, going back to sort of what Rebecca was saying that, you know, he really made an effort to ensure that I was, that I understood and was connected to that history. At the same time, you know, I did, I lost my father at 13. And so like any connection to either of their cultures was tenuous. And so part of the project of the book was for me to learn about those histories that I didn't learn about in school because we didn't study them, you know, and so I spent a lot of time, I even discovered some narratives of my family um, in collections of, um, of narratives of, of genocide survivors and sort of immersed myself in those stories um, that helped to kind of contextualize my mother's family and her experience and where she came from. And um, I think through that, I was able to discover sort of within this sort of anger that I had at her for weaving, I was also able to kind of find compassion and understanding, you know, around sort of the trauma that that we all care. You know, I, I knew that I was certainly carrying trauma with me and I could imagine that, you know, she might have been carrying trauma as well. And so that sort of um, gave me sort of a, a, a window to be able to sort of reach out to her um, towards reconciliation and you know it's a work in progress I would say that we have a good relationship now we're friends we we talk you know and we've gotten to know each other and um, it's been really meaningful to me to learn about Armenian culture and um, and to sort of reconnect with that part of uh, part of who I am as well um, so yeah I think I think that uh, that sort of the writing of the book kind of opened up new possibilities um, for what relationship I could have with my mother. Mm. That is mm. so powerful. But also I was so struck by what you said about carrying trauma. Um, and as you know, having read the book and whoever else has read the book, you know, I also have a birth mother, a white mm -hmm. birth mother yep. who has her own trauma. But I, I do also think it's important to um, interrogate the ways in which trauma is processed, utilized, the way that it exists in your body and your psyche. Um, you know, we said earl I said earlier how, you know, after a while, after a period of time, I was ready for that trauma to live elsewhere. Like I had cared for it long enough. Um, and so for, for in my story, in case, I feel like my white birth mother has not actually dealt well with her trauma and that makes it really hard right um but again the sort of ongoing theme for memoirists is that we kind of approach everything with this radical compassion mm -hmm. as as much as we possibly can and so i'm just really i'm i'm so i'm happy to hear that you are open to this relationship and i hope that it um I hope that it brings you both a kind of uh, to a next kind of level evolution. Thank you. And what you said is so important too. I think one of the reasons that, you know, it was one thing to sort of reach out to my mother and it was another thing in terms of how 
that reaching out would be received. And I think my mom has done some of her own work too. You know, she she is willing to engage with me and to really go there and isn't defensive. In fact, you know, with the book that, you know, I write about a lot of the hard parts about our relationship and she has been the biggest supporter of the book. Like she's driving around to New England, taking photos of it in bookstores and, you know, it has come to, um, readings where I've, you know, read stories about our relationship that must be difficult for her to, to hear. But I think because of the work that she has done to sort of interrogate her own trauma, as you're saying, I think that that's part of how we're able to connect in a different way. That's amazing. I, I have a question. I think one of you, I think it was Rebecca brought up Toni Morrison. I think you both mentioned Toni Morrison's writing at some point during the course of the evening. And one of the things that Toni Morrison always said was that she, she was particularly rigorous in her writing to ensure that she was not writing for the white gaze. She was under a lot of pressure at the beginning of her career about, you know, I, I remember there was some comment about, well, you know, she only writes about black people or, or whatever it was. It was a very- And ultimately of, to be a good writer, you'll you'll write about white people. Right, yeah. exactly. That was that was the, the sort of yeah. the slant of it. And she was rigid and, and determined to, to make her voice to, to not have her voice, um, I, I, I'm, I'm in, she, in on the She here. was rigid about making her voice central to the yeah. narrative. And yeah. that page upon page upon page was blackness. Yes. Not a single white person. Um, yes. This was one of the things that I write about in, in my book, which is like, who knew? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, but I, but I think there was also, a, in addition to the rigidity, if if I, I probably wouldn't characterize it that way, but but also there was a, such a joy. Mm -hmm. She was, yeah. she loves her characters, and it, you feel it, you feel that resolute love for her mm -hmm. characters, even though they're all super problematic. But they're oh, also, God. but yeah, it's, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she, she, you know, she said that she claimed center. She claimed she. Yes. Yeah. The center and she claimed it and allowed yeah. everyone else to sort of come to that. But that yeah. of the interviewer who's sort of asking her, well, well, when are you going to write about white people? Are you yeah. like, when, I, when I'm like in a bad mood, I watch that yes. of her. So she says, Nadia, she <laughs> says, you have no idea how, how racist, racist, that racist that is. <laughs> that is that you're saying. Yeah. No, I, I love, love that. that. So much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she was yeah. amazing. Um, Let's have a look. We have a question here. Uh, I'm an actor and appeared as Lionel George and Weezy Sun on the Jeffersons. Oh. Do, do you watch shows like these and Good Times or did you as a child? And how did they inform your identity as a young black girl at the time? It's a really good question for, for me specifically because there were these shows that existed, but I would have had to have had encouragement to value them, right? because I was still seeing the world through the white gaze. So you could watch George Jefferson or you could watch The Love Boat. Probably The Love Boat is better. Um, and that showed up in, in ratings, that showed up in conversation with my peers, that showed up in what we saw covered in the media. Um, and that is the white gaze, right? The value, um, the standard of beauty, the standard of excellence, the standard of canon, the standard of mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, I read your book, Surviving the White Gaze, and loved it. Uh, how sensitive and supportive were your black male partners to the facts and circumstances of your actual upbringing? My black male partners. Um, uh, so I do write a lot about relationships, my relationships in this book. Um, three prominent black male um, partners. Um, that's really hard to answer. Like, I, I mean, I would say that, that my boyfriend was amazing and one supportive and mindful because he also was biracial, although it identified as black. Um, um, yeah, I don't really know how to answer that question. <laughs> Nadia? Um, yeah, I, 
I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it, it varied relationship to relationship, but I think I have had a lot of sort of deep, deep conversations with black men about blackness and relationships between black men and black women and sort of the ways that white supremacy also uh, impacts those relationships, you know, and when I say right. conversations, sometimes I mean arguments, but I think that, you know, I think the whole spectrum of like how we understand who we are in the world and who we are to each other, like certainly um, some of those conversations with black men and also with black women have been some of the, the best ways that I have learned about sort of how to be in better relationship with people, period. And yeah. the kind of honesty and self-interrogation, you know, that that I sort of bring to the page around my own relationship to white supremacy, to blackness, and um, and sort of sharing that with other black people. Um, I have received so many similar stories about, you know, the the time when I would, you know, like everyone has that story of sort of where they might have aligned themselves with whiteness and the regrets that they have about that. Um, and sort of who they want to be. Um, there's a big conversation about sort of black love and black relationships. And I certainly like had many conversations with loved ones about, about that as well. Um, question for Nadia, having lived all over the world, what's your take on racism in America and racial identity in America versus other parts of the world? Yeah, I mean, anti-blackness is a global phenomenon, <laughs> um, mm. and it sort of undergirds our all of our system, all of our global systems, including capitalism. You know, and, and that's what colonization sort of um, created that dynamic and slavery, and you know, wherever you go, even if you live in a um, in Africa, you know, which which I did, it's the 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 bigger systems within which the world operates um, still insist that black people wherever you are are sort of at the bottom of the the ladder you know and and we're seeing that now with covid you know and who has access to vaccines who is dying with dying from covid you know it is a global phenomenon i will say that um that the shape that anti-blackness takes is different depending on where you are and that's sort of part of what you know as a black person who grew up sort of moving around, I had to figure out what it meant to be a black person in each of the, the places mm -hmm. where I lived, you know? Mm -hmm. So like in Italy, there weren't, or at least in the community where I lived in Italy, there weren't that many of us. And so mm -hmm. it could mean any number of things, you know? Um, it could mean anything from sort of, I want to touch your skin to see if the color rubs off um, to sort of get out of my country, you know? like. A, there were sort of mm -hmm. ways that people sort of responded to me. Um, in America, I think one of the things that was most obvious to me in moving to America as a black person was the ways in which that anti-blackness and anti-black racism in particular, racism in general and anti-black racism in particular have been baked into all of the systems and policies and structures that sort of undergird the choices that people can make in their lives in terms of where they live and where they go to school and how you're in relationship with each other. And so that, that I think was something that definitely stood out to me um, coming to America as a black person. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, do you have anything to add? I know you've not lived, I don't know if, know if you've lived abroad, but um, just your- No, I mean, I've spent some time abroad. I just- I just reading and yeah. I, I love that. Um, I mean, it feels like a very nice um, uh, note to end on just in that, you know, anti-black racism is global and, and baked into certainly in America, choices and policy and, and all the rest. But I also feel like just in this hour, you know, um, Nadia and I have both kind of um, resonated with this sense of self and joy and pride um, and ancestral um, um, gratitude. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled and enlightened by this conversation. Well, we are thrilled by it too and enlightened. <laughs> and two, two wonderful books. Thank you both for a, a very enlightening and, and 
really interesting and wonderful discussion. Nadia Owusu and Rebecca Carroll, everybody, Aftershocks and Surviving the White Gaze. We have signed copies of both books at oblongbooks.com. Just press the button here on your screen. I'd like to say a big thanks to Maggie Southard and Anne Pierce Tate at Simon & Schuster for making this event possible. Thanks to all of you who have joined us on Crowdcast. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Rebecca. And we wish you all good night and be well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.